All right, hello everybody and welcome to a new episode of On Air. Today we are joined by curator and editor of Liminal Spaces, Migration and Women of the Guyanese Diaspora, Grace Aniza Ali, and artists Shushitra Matai and Claudia Cano. We are exploring concepts of migration this season at Lux, and I am so thrilled that these amazing women are joining me today to talk more about this topic and their approaches and their ideas around it. Um, in today's conversation, we are explore, exploring specifically women's perspectives and diasporic experiences and the liminal spaces cr created by migration. So for those of you that are interested in Grace's book, Victor will be sharing a link in our, um, in our chat, so check it out. Uh, it's absolutely amazing, filled with really beautiful, very important and impactful stories. Um, Shushitras is one of them and Grace also contributed to the book um, as both an editor and curator, as well as uh, a woman from uh, Guyana. So today we are bringing together the conversation about the Guyanese and Mexican diaspora. Uh, specifically thinking about the construction of identity within migration conversations and the liminal spaces you find yourself in when living between two different countries, places, and or cultures, and sometimes even more than two. Yeah, identity gets very complex within migration and sharing stories is what's so important and so central that we keep doing in order to learn and grow as a community. So a big part of the construction of identity is a sense of belonging. And as Grace points out in liminal spaces, uh, migration is very disruptive and fragmenting. When leaving a place, that time stops for you. It, it's no longer passing, but for the people that you leave behind, their time keeps um, continuing. So there's this kind of disruption that happens. And, and the sense of belonging that is can, that you're, uh, is very much connected to the time that you left creates this really um, kind of a tear in an identity. And uh, furthermore, the messaging of migrant identities is often controlled by colonial histories, by the media and by politics. So often immigrants and their identities are constructed by very polarizing stereotypes, or as Grace discusses in Liminal Spaces, um, single stories. And this polarization and uh, this construction of identity is often resulting in invisibility or characterization of diasporic identities. And um, often resulting into a permanent outsider identity within a new nation that uh, where the migration system is all regulated by othering. That was a mouthful, <laughs> but just to set up kind of the conversation that we're having today. But before we dive in, I want to introduce in more detail our amazing panelists. So let me share my screen with you. So first, our uh, curator, Grace Aniza Ali. She's a curator whose research focuses on contemporary social engaged art practices from all around the world and the Caribbean diaspora, with a specific focus on her home country, Guyana. Uh, seen in this photograph uh, is an image of Grace's chapter in Liminal Spaces. Grace is an assistant professor in the Department of Art and Public Policy at the Tisch School of Arts at NYU. And additionally, she has an incredibly impressive track record. Um, she is the curator at large for the Caribbean Cultural Center of African Diaspora Institute in New York, the founder and curator of Guyana Modern, an online platform for contemporary arts and culture in Guyana, a founder and editorial director of Of Note Magazine, an award-winning nonprofit arts journalism initiative reporting on the intersection of art and activism. And she has received many awards and fellowships, including NYU's Provost Faculty Fellow, the Andy Warhol Foundation Curatorial Fellow, the Fulbright Scholar, and she's been named a World Economic Forum Global Shaper. Thanks so much for joining, Grace. <laughs> Shushitra is one of the incredibly featured artists in liminal spaces. Her work weaves together her family's history and ideas of migrant displacement. 
with a focus on laying bare the long histories of, of invisibility and migrant identities, employing processes of and materials that bring in issues around labor and gender. In the book, Liminal Spaces, Shushitra explores ideas centered around finding the imagined home. She discusses her family's journey first from India to Guyana as, an, in, uh, as indentured servants and later their migration to Canada and the United States. Shushitra takes into consideration domestic practices, thinking about female labor, tying it together with colonial and family histories. Shushitra has received an MFA in painting and drawing and an MA in, um, in South Asian art from the University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. And she has exhibited with K Contemporary in Denver, the Sar Sarja <laughs> Bayani, I'm sorry, I totally butchered that, <laughs> in the United States, uh, the United Emirate, uh, Arab Emirates, uh, the Biennial, Biennial of the Americas at the Denver Art Museum, Pen and Brush in New York City that was curated by Grace, <laughs> the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver, amongst many others. And she has been featured in publications such, such as Hyperallergic, Documenta Journal, a Cultural Magazine, and Har Harper's Bazaar Arabia, amongst others. Also joining us is our very own Claudia Cano. Claudia is an interdisciplinary artist working with performance, photography, video, screen printing, weaving, and embroidery. Her work fo focuses on the intersection between Mexican and United States cultures, specifically thinking about the invisibility and inequality of immigrant women's labor. Claudia calls into question the occupation of space as Latinx, specifically thinking about occupying white spaces and domestic spaces. Thinking about the labor role, labor and roles performed by Latinx workers and the disparities and invisibility involved within that, and thus exploring her own role within the United States society. Claudia received her MFA from the San Diego State University and has exhibited and performed at Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, Torrance Art Museum, the San Diego Art Institute, Quint Gallery, SDSU, Downtown Gallery, Oceanside Museum of Art, amongst many others. And she has received the Dependent Winter Residency, the San Diego Art Prize, Exploring Engagement Initiative grant by the James Irvine Foundation from Oceanside Museum of Art and the Wind Gate Scholarship. So I wanna thank all three of you so much for joining me today. Um, I like the snaps, so welcome. <laughs> Ah, okay, I'm out of breath, so I'm ready to hand it over uh, to you uh, for the conversation. And uh, as we've talked about a little bit in the introduction, um, I would love to explore this a little bit more about how you address the invisibility of immigrant identities in your work. And I'm leaving it open, whoever would like to answer first. <laughs> um. Well, it's, it's, it's an ongoing practice, you know, it's difficult to just define as an artist and as a woman and as an educator, what is my place to be at? It's always since, you know, San Diego is a border city and, you know, it's, it's very easy to have this, you know, bicultural identity. Uh, in my experience, I've been questioned why not to reconfigure, you know, the power relations instead of uh, just uh, talk and create this alter ego that is, you know, tailoring to stereotypes. And the answer for me is simple. Why not? It, it con It's a continuum. You know, we were just talking, Grace and I, before going on air. And uh, when I moved here, in, in a mainly com white community, I only found two stereotypes, but they are not stereotypes. That, uh, those are the consequence of a colonial system, you know, from Mexico, where you can only find, you know, the rich lady and the cleaning lady. And dealing with redefining my identity, I decided to play along with them and go for it, you know, be, be cynical and just put it in the face of everybody to kind of like 
fight it and uh, discuss it and be just out there questioning. Um, in terms of invisibility, Guyana is a, shall we say, lesser known um, community. Guy the Guyanese people are a lesser known community. So there are stereotypes, um, you know, if you live in New York, for example, there are stereotypes of what it is to be Guy Guyanese. Because I think, Grace, um, you mentioned that in your book that the Guyanese population in New York is maybe the fifth largest immigrant population. Um, so there are definitely stereotypes um, sort of uh, lurking. Um, but I think being maybe anonymous in a way for me, um, through the places I've lived, so Nova Scotia, Canada, uh, since I've left Guyana, and uh, right now I'm in Denver, I've lived in Minneapolis, different places. Um, for me, it's about constructing or reconstructing the story that is my past, right? So, um, you know, having a family that were brought to Guyana as indentured laborers uh, from India, I'm very much in interested in, invested in both South Asian culture, um, but also um, Guyanese culture, and then obviously the culture that I'm in here, here in America. So some of the tangible ways that I address invisibility um, are one, um, through monuments to women of the South Asian diaspora. So for example, one of the images uh, you showed um, was a, was created, it's a tapestry created of vintage saris from all over the world. And so it's a way of connecting diaspora um, uh, of, you know, women from different diasporas, but of South Asian descent. Yeah, that, that one. Um, and creating something so large and present um, that you can't be ignored. And so I think that's one of the ways that I do it. I also uh, paint portraiture um, and make mixed media fiber-based portraits of women um, of color, um, particularly for my family, as a way, again, of unearthing uh, stories and giving voice to people who haven't had a voice before. Um, and there's, there's more, but that, those are some of the ways. I think you all will agree that a lot of the, and I'm thinking of your work too, Claudia, and what you're doing, and Suchitra, a lot of, a lot of the times when we see stories about immigrant women or migrant women, they're not told by them, right? There's this gaze on them and they're told by a whole host of other people, but it's not them telling their own stories and them sharing with us what it's like to be them and to be in their shoes. And so I think one of the ways to tackle that invisibility is to provide the spaces and uplift these women to tell their own stories. Or if you happen to be, you know, like us, the daughters or granddaughters or great granddaughters of these women, then you find a way to tell the stories of your mothers and your grandmothers. And one of the stories I write in the book, Liminal Spaces, and this is the one you love, Busha, titled Indra, was when I went to India, you know, it's a uh, customary experience that you have uh, a maid, you have somebody helping you around the house. And I was so uncomfortable with that because the woman that was helping me, a beautiful woman by the name Indra, she reminded me so much of my grandmother and my grandmother's job in Guyana was to clean other people's houses. And I knew that the emotional toll that took on her, one of the things I write about was how she struggled with keeping other women's houses sparkling clean and came home to a poor home of her own. You know, what that does to you as a person to go to work every day in the fancy house, but to come home and, you know, you live in a shack. And I try to capture what it's like to be in that position. And that's also a kind of liminal space, you know? But I think to tackle the invisibility, 
we have to be conscious of that, that most of the times women that are immigrants or in these positions aren't given the opportunity to voice their own stories. It's been written about and shown by another gaze that's not theirs. And so if I think we're more conscious about that, and then again, as the daughters and granddaughters, if we take on the mantle of saying, this is what it's like for my grandmother to clean other people's houses and then come home to her, her home that pales in comparison to the shiny, fancy, rich houses, what that does you know, to you as, as a woman, as a human, as a worker, um, if we're able to provide the spaces to really speak honestly about what that is and what that's like, I think that's a way to tackle it, Lucia. Yeah, I love what you're saying there, uh, Grace. Thank you so much. I think uh, it leads really well into the next question, too, about the occupying of domestic space like you are talking about and, you know, kind of the accessibility to domestic spaces. And I know uh, Shushitra and Claudia, you're both talking about uh, the occupation of domestic spaces as well. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how you address that specifically in your work? Also thinking about domestic labor or uh, women's labor as well sure I can I can go first um, you know so Grace you were mentioning grandmothers mothers and thinking about their roles um, you know one of my grandmothers was a seamstress um, and my other grandmother sewed all of her own clothes uh, you know and she had worked in you know the rice fields she got married one of them when she was uh, 16, uh, she had 12 children and was, you know, illiterate. And so I think a lot about her story, but, and, but also what she taught me. And so, you know, learning to embroider, learning to crochet, learning to make, learning to sew clothing, um, that's very much a part of my practice. Uh, in that way, I'm able to tell her stories. Um, I also use a lot of domestic, um, found domestic objects in my work. And so, you know, my whole, my overarching project is to rewrite colonial history, right? And to, to include the voices of others. So using uh, domestic objects and reimagining them, um, asserting them into installations, um, reworking them to tell more intimate stories of my family's past is a way of using those spaces as, um, should we say, uh, as maybe comfortable spaces, as spaces that tell that their particular stories as a kind of platform or um, safe space for them. I love what you're saying too within colonial histories, this idea of a domestic space, especially for like endangered labor, there was no domestic space that people had, right? So you're not as much re rewriting or reclaiming but claiming and writing because this was not something that was part of that colonial history the, oh. the ownership to the domestic space yeah yeah and it's it is an inventing in a way um i think when one looks you know when one has migrated so many steps in such a few well in so such a few amount of my my family has lived on three different continents in a matter of you know, just a couple generations. And I think that a lot of, you know, thinking about memory, thinking about history, there's also a lot of myth, right? That's involved in this recreating, in recreating the story. Um, and so the invention of these spaces, you're, you're very much right. I'm taking these colonial, these objects that are from a colonial past, you know, furniture from the era that my family would have, you know, migrated or through forced labor or through indentured labor from India, and then creating completely new environments with them. So. Yeah, well, we know we, we are also talking about it used to. This is still happening, you know, uh, based on the census in 2013, the most common jobs for Latinas ages 24 to 54, which is my age, uh, for Latina women are cleaning ladies, nannies, uh, um, home care aides, waitresses, and cashiers. So this is still happening, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, moving or, or uh, 
coming to a, a, another country, you lose sense of identity and women most likely, uh, they become, you know, the help who can, you know, find a job anywhere they can to support their family. So those napkins that Hughes has, is uh, showing right now, they were part of uh, an installation performance piece that I, I did, it feels like it was a long time ago. I started in November last year and it ended in uh, the beginning of this year. So it was a long ongoing uh, performance where um, I'm not um, a stereotype. I'm myself having conversations with people and visitors in a gallery space here in, in San Diego, it's called Bread and, Bread and Salt. And the gallery became uh, kind of like a taco shop, a stand providing food. But the main objective of uh, creating this installational piece was, you know, uh, having this conversation and uh, tension between performance, art, and providing a service. And the ultimate goal was giving at the end uh, those napkins that you show with information, right? So uh, it was like, uh, take it or leave it. Uh, there was a sign describing this is not a performance but it was actually a performance so it was like you know this this game or this um playfulness of my performance and in many ways that is ironic but it's it's at the end you know very serious where i'm mentioning the income uh how much um you know the difference between white men and and women getting paid or latina women so after having the conversation after uh providing food uh, traditional Mexican food, which is also breaking the boundaries with what is uh, being appropriated by American culture, you know, like the version of tacos and salsas and, you know, Jamaica water, which is, uh, I forgot the name what in, in, in English, how do you call it? Oh my gosh, I went blank. Anyways, so at the end of the, the conversation, I will give uh, people those napkins and they were they were invited to read them or just toss them away so it's pretty much trashable art which gives the tension or provides the tension the outcome of what will happen with maintenance and with labor right no one sees it but it's there so it's pretty much you know uh getting uh the front row in performance to um, drawing attention to invisible labor rather than just to create, uh, which I do too, but having to wear a quite colonialized uniform that, you know, many women are still wearing in other parts of, you know, the world as, you know, um, maids or cleaning ladies. And even here, you know, I've seen those uniforms wear by uh, maintenance people, or maintenance women, well, why not just wear it? So the, the uniform is quite colonialized. The, the ponytail, the scapular that Ross is wearing, the, the behavior that she, she has, it's always activating those roles that women have been perpetuated or forced to perpetuate. So the scapular is there, you know, like the, the, the face, the position, she's very submissive. Uh, in a way, when it, uh, when, I become Rosa, I'm, I'm there, you know, the, the history is still going. And especially in white, white spaces where the majority of visitors are not uh, brown and black communities, it, it draws more attention, you know, what is she doing there? And uh, why is she cleaning in the middle of an opening? Uh, it's, you know, upsetting when she's cleaning for hours on and on without, you know, any, any, um, breaks or not stopping is creating that tension without any discourse without any you know conversation or dialogue with anyone claudia this that image that work i mean it's so powerful it's so powerful and we've all been in those scenes we've all been in those scenes uh, it, i just it's one of my for lack of a better word claudia favorites uh pieces hmm. that you've um, you've done. I also, to Gusha's, to Gusha's question about the domestic space and, and Suchitra was talking earlier about, you know, her grandmother and mother being a seamstress. Was well, your mom also a seamstress or just a gra your grandmother? Her mom, so she knew 
go and I'll yeah. do all those practices, which I include in my work now. Yeah, well, so many, so many of the women who wrote chapters in the book talk about how the domestic space, the home became a place of entrepreneurship for, for them and for their mothers and grandmothers. So when you can't find the nine to five over the table, you know, W2 paycheck job, you're using your home, you're using the kitchen, you're using your sewing machine, you're using whatever to to be entrepreneurs and to have a little bit of economic independence. So I think for a lot of immigrant people, the domestic space also has that aspect to it, where it's a space for entrepreneurship and it's a, it's a space for income. My mother's going to kill me, but my mother is the most amazing roti maker and she's turned her kitchen into a little roti shop. And she makes, you know, she makes a little extra money. And she's always from Guyana to the United States. She's always, always figured out how to use her home to bring in money and to be an entrepreneur. So I think it can, it, you know, it's also very much a space of economic empowerment. Yes, I completely agree with you. My mom, uh... So she didn't sew uh, to make money or cook, but she typed people's papers, <laughs> graduate students' papers, so that so she could do that in the house, you know, with her children. Um, so yeah, I think you're very you're very right. It's the home is 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 a space for entrepreneurship for new immigrants for sure. I feel like also um, to smoothly lead into my next question. I feel like domestic spaces are at least in my personal experience are the space where i feel like i truly belong when spe specifically in my own domestic space where i'm not trying to culturally pass either within the united states or uh, as a dutch person and just being able to let go of those things um which you know leads into my <laughs> question um with the migrant identity really um being about belonging and this uh, idea that in order to belong somewhere, uh, sorry, my cat is hungry. <laughs> <laughs> this happens every time around this time of day. So maybe I should switch the on airs to be a different time so the cat doesn't get so annoying. Anyway, sorry, distraction. Um, this idea of belonging, right? And that in order to really get accepted or to belong there is this idea of cultural passing that happens that um, makes you able to blend and cultural passing is about giving up parts of yourself in order to to fit in to appropriate to assimilate um, and I don't know if you agree with this but I guess this is me from my personal experience and then wanting to ask you what your thoughts are on this um, and then ultimately what that means to kind of the fragment fragment fragmentation of the self and maybe if you agree or if there's something you're thinking about how do you reconcile that in your work how are you saying like wait a minute let's bring this back to you know to myself and to my identity without that fragmentation happening. Gosh, if she could only see our journals, right? About, about, about trying to figure out that, the answers to that question. Help me out here, you all. Um, go ahead, Suchit. Okay, so I, I was just gonna say that, um, you know, Guyana, being from a country that is physically in South America, but not the culturally of the Caribbean, and uh, and then you know, fragmented beyond that into different um, you know uh, populations. So for me, Indo Caribbean, right? Um, and then you know, not having looking as if I'm South Asian, but not speaking Hindi or any other South Asian language. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's so many levels of fragmentation involved. Uh, so, you know, um, on the surface, I, I look Indian. So a lot of people will try to speak to me in another language. 
or expect that I would know another language. Um, and, and people, I've often encountered people from South Asia thinking that uh, South Asians of the diaspora are not really South Asian, right? So there's that sort of level of um, kind of dismissal. Uh, then of course, you know, I don't also, I don't know about Caucasian, so then there's, all, there's always this sort of mystery which leads to this kind of um, really a, a sense of not really belonging anywhere except in your house, <laughs> you know what I mean, in your home. And I think uh, my whole life, you know, I looked to India at one point to find that kind of uh, belonging, but again, just being very different, it, it wasn't there. So even, you know, in visiting um, India, I, I felt like an other as well. Um, in terms of my practice, um, you know, oh, I want—I did want to add one other thing. The India of Diana is, uh, you know, 1900 and, uh, I mean, I, it's a mid 19th century uh, idea, really, because the Indians that came, you know, as indentured laborers in the mid 19th century uh, were rather conservative relative to the Indians of now, only they've stayed in their enclave and, um, you know, haven't modernized in a certain way until they've left. So there, there are all these different levels, right, of um, complexity. In terms of my work, I, I feel as though um, through my work there, I'm very much looking for re reconciliation in terms of materials, for example. So in a lot of my mixed media works, I will take very disparate objects, objects that are found that are vintage, that have a colonial history sometimes, that have a reference to um, domestic practices. And I will put them together in a way where I'm trying to reconcile them. And I've realized so much of my work is about that. It's about trying to make things that are very different uh, fit together. I like to share with you an uh, excerpt from uh, Guillermo Gomez Peña and uh, Ingo Stroika, his, his, one of his books, where he, I mean, I identify myself so well with this paragraph. It says, my journey goes not only from south to north, but from the past to the future, from Spanish to English, and from one side of myself to another. I walk the fibers of this transition in my everyday life, and I make art about it. If I wouldn't have found art, art making, I was a photographer. I was a professor in Mexico. I had, you know, my life said and done, but you know, I fell in love and came here. And my identity went out the door, right? Uh, so it took years to redefine who I was and raising uh, bicultural kids and one that is pretty much was born blonde, uh, it you know struck me in, in a personal way. Uh, I'm the mother that you were you're talking, the one that has the accent, the one that couldn't find a job besides you know as a receptionist for years, and the only outlet that I had to to redefine and define who I was and who I am is art. So performing. Uh, it's so strong for me, Whoever, whatever role I'm performing, I take it to heart. Most of my performances, yeah, they are known, but they are not announced. So when I'm in the public, when I'm in, in public spaces, which was very, you know, not symbolic to what happens to immigrants, you have to start from scratch. So I started from scratch. The first performances were in open spaces and I was the photographer and the performance artist as well. It was crazy, but I, I aim it to that way. So the notions of isolation, the notions of having uh, language barriers are still there. You know, I'm still here, you can listen to me. There's nothing that I can do at this point in my life to raise my accent, to raise my skin color, to raise, you know, the way I look. And it's a constant question, right? And a question uh, reaffirmation, which I hate when people talk to me in, in, in Spanish, or thank you, senorita. It's like mocking, but you know, but the way that I fight back is through art, through performance, through art making, to even, you know, as an educator, creating programs and um, 
um, opening spaces for uh, black and, and brown artists so they can also talk and have validation and have those spaces that it took four years for me to be at. Um, I think I've accepted that I'm always going to struggle with these feelings of fragmentation and all of these liminal spaces and how they show up. I just, I think a few years ago, I stopped trying to uh, fight it and just accept that maybe as an immigrant, that is a lifetime struggle that you just have to embrace and submit to. And I wanna share that one of the ways that I feel that fragmentation acutely is when I have to flip out my American passport, which I now have to go somewhere. And it reminds me of when I had a Guyanese passport, how much bureaucracy and paperwork and approvals and visas and documentations and stamps it took to go anywhere. But with this American passport, I can just flip it out and almost go anywhere I want to. Remember the first time I went to Europe and I didn't need a visa to go to Europe. You would just I should just get on a plane to London anytime I want to with an American passport, because I remember what it's what it's like not to have that privilege. And so that's another fragmentation and liminal space that I think we as immigrants are are constantly battling the privilege you have now with certain things like having this blue book because you're you know you're now a citizen versus when you didn't have it and the confinement that you had versus the sort of freedom to move about the world that you have now and then so many people that you love that are still in Guyana don't have that freedom. And here you are, you know, freely moving about, this is pre-COVID days, of course, right? But here you are freely moving about the world because of this little book that you have now. And that is incredibly, incredibly jarring. And every time I have to get on a plane and go somewhere, it is not lost on me that with this blue American passport, all of the privilege privileges I have now that I didn't have when I was, you know, a Guyanese citizen with a Guyanese passport. Uh, I, I actually, I love this conversation and it's bringing back uh, a conversation I literally had yesterday with uh, Yasmin Kasim, uh, who is an amazing local artist as well. And we were actually talking about, um, how we identify artists um, and how in contemporary conversations we basically have the artist which is the white male and then we have the insert whatever identifier artist we have the female artist we have the Guyanese artist we have the Mexican artist the Latinx artist whatever and we were talking about how problematic that is right because that already creates that fra fragmentation within our own discourse and how that we should start making co conscious efforts to to not describe ourselves and each other in those ways you know instead of being like oh you know i am a queer artist say i am an artist who investigates queer uh, conversations and i think that's the power of what the art and the art world can do as far as the migration conversation, right? We can stop stop talking about ourselves as outsiders, as not part of uh, the, the mainstream conversation of the United States or whatever the world, and rather change our statements to saying, no, no, we are part of the United States and we are considering these elements and the cat is going crazy. <laughs> Sorry, it's very distracting. Um, and I think, you know, that's where what's so important about migration is that we are still having that conversation of like, we're outsiders and trying to be insiders, but at the same time, we've always been insiders, right? With our colo the colonial histories, with all of those things. Sorry, 
I don't know if you can hear my cat. <laughs> no, we can't. <laughs> okay. So you just hear me freaking out. I'm sorry. Um, and anyway, so I think that's the power of having these particular conversations and kind of redefining um, how we talk about art, how we talk about these conversations. And that was such a great conversation I had with Yasmin yesterday. And I definitely keep thinking about that more. I just wanted to bring that up too. And she's teaching a class tonight. Oh, yes. Yes. What yeah. the heck is contemporary art? <laughs> yeah. When she finds out, you know, she has to let us know because. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I wanted to kind of follow up this conversation that we're having, and I think Claudia, you addressed it a little bit, but this idea of belonging and what it means for first generations. And I know that uh, Grace, you've talked about it too, or some of your artists have talked about it in the book as well, but this idea of being a first generation and um, your tie to that other identity being a parent being a grandparent and what happens when you lose that connection and what what does that mean for an identity so I wanted to open that up see if anybody had thoughts well I've been thinking about you know uh, as a personal level which I rarely talk in in, uh, in public um, it's it's, uh, I feel that it's my responsibility to raise my kids in both cultures. But now, you know, there's a lot of tension, political tensions, and the awareness is there. And I have, you know, bicultural, biracial children, and one was born here. So my, my responsibility is more on, on her to raise her, to make her understand the tensions, the, the ideas, what is, you know, moving or immigrating, which it was in her case. So I have become the storyteller and I have created this narrative for her. And my older two kids, they immigrated with me, which immigrated with me. So it, they have their own experiences and they also go through these notions of identity and one is already a citizen, the other one doesn't want to become a citizen. So it's always, it's an ongoing, it's an, an ongoing conversation and in, uh, in the family where, you know, we, we always talk about it and we always feel uncomfortable, you know, even with celebrations, like the, why are we celebrating Thanksgiving? That's you know, out of the question. So we eliminated Thanksgiving years ago. And, you know, all those, conversations are, are part of it. So probably that's where, where my practice uh, lies on. The domestic uh, space is always in the conversation with my kids as, as, again, you know, as an educator and as an artist, I have the responsibility to raise them with the awareness of what is to be, you know, a universal citizen. Yeah, I've never said that in public. Ooh. Hope they don't see it. <laughs> so, do you want to go, Grace? No, go ahead, sweetheart. So, I just wanted to, to actually touch upon what you're saying. It's interesting because part of my practice is unearthing stories, stories that I, I you know, I, I wasn't told when I was growing up. So, it's very interesting how my parents didn't really share a lot about their past in Bayan. It was only when I asked questions. And I think part of that is that, I mean, there was very much, it was very much present in the food we ate, the music we listened to, et cetera. But in terms of stories about, you know, people in Guyana or people, you know, great, great, great grandparents or grandparents and their families and their stories, I had to really delve deep to find that, to do research, to ask. And my father sometimes says, why are you asking these questions? And it's interesting for me, to me, it is about belonging, right? It's about knowing. If I know, the more I know, the more I feel connected um, to the past that I'm a part of. You know, in terms of just touching on what you said, Claudia, um, about your children, my children are also biracial. Um, you know, many, many a time, my elder son, looks Caucasian and I've been asked if I was the nanny on several occasions um, and you know when he was younger uh, and you know it is something of there is something about 
the sense of universality of being the universal global citizen that you want to bring to your family. Um, but there is also something about holding on to a very specific past that makes it alive and makes you feel connected through history and through topography that is really important. Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, part of why a lot of cultures, when they migrate, they they freeze time, right? Because we're trying to hold on to something. So while the other time keeps moving, we're still tied to that time that we left, yeah. So we have actually a great question from Cosmo um, <laughs> in our chat. Um, as uncomfortable uh, the liminal space can be, do you think that fragmentation is a source of strength beyond the creative outlet? Well, I, I can answer that too. I don't know. I'll answer from my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I've always found that it's a privilege to be derooted in some place, in some ways, to not feel really truly feel a connection to anything while it feels like I'm free falling most of the time and I have no real place that I can ever rest because there's no place like that for me anymore. There's at the same time, a lot of freedom that comes within that and a lot of possibilities for me to explore, to understand things from wider perspectives because I'm not so deeply rooted into anything anymore. At least that's for me, the experience. I, I would say that I share your experience, that there is strength and freedom. Um, I very much feel like a global citizen and I, I don't, um, because I've lived in so many different places, I don't feel particularly connected to any, but it allows me um, to dissect and to critique and to cherish all of those aspects um, and, and, and not really feel like I'm privileging any one of them. And in a way that, I don't know, there's something about that that is very free, that I, I, I'm not owned by any particular culture. I, I feel I feel that freedom every day. I think it certainly makes you more empathetic. You know, I think submitting, as I said, just submitting to it and not trying to, to fight your way out of it and submit it to it as a lifelong thing you'll deal with. I think it certainly makes you more empathetic because we can talk about fragmentation and liminal spaces outside of this narrative, migration narrative. You know, it that those feelings of separation and um, and fragmentation apply to so many other things and other parts of our lives. And I, I think it certainly allows you to be a more empathetic person. I honestly don't have an answer yet, depending on the day, depending on who I am with depending on, you know, the circumstances. I, I think that, you know, one of the investigations that I did in, in grad school, which, you know, I went back to school uh, a couple of years ago and I, I was obviously even older than my, my professors. But one of the artworks that I did uh, was a recording a voiceover, selling a product that it will be a spray on your mouth you know, that you'll spray it and it will erase your accent and it's called accento. Mm -hmm. uh, because I found out that having an accent, it's also an obstacle to get ahead in the game. So to me, I'm already fragmented. I can't, you know, there's nothing that I can do besides, you know, like dealing with it or, you know, like I know when people even haven't been exposed to different accents because they look at your lips and they look at my lips, like trying to figure it out. So uh, right now, the notions are, I'm very sensitive. And having a mask makes it worse. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, they cannot even read my lips. And, uh, you know, having to, to talk to, you know, customers, and it's difficult. So um, 
I'm constantly, you know, questioning. There's no, no space for, for not being critical. You know, regardless of my practice, just the every day, I have to deal with it. I wish many times to not have an accent. So it wouldn't be, <laughs> you know, like this kind of um, credential or like, yeah. I'm sorry. I to add that um, in addition to empathy and uh, freedom and stress that you're talking about, there's a general sense of anxiety of not belonging to something as well. So it's uh, it's twofold. You know? Yeah, and even you know, like having uh, to deal with different audiences uh, in some places as a, as a you know teaching artist. Uh, depending where I'm, I'm located, I can be uh, identified as the aunt, the auntie or mom, or, you know, a relative, or I can be identified as, oh, you just speak like my nanny, mm -hmm. you know, like being said by kids, right? Kids are innocent, so they say why, what they think. And so this duality is always, it's a constant duality. So to me, it's like, uh, I can be um, yeah, I have to develop a lot, of, a lot of tolerance, but it comes out in my performances, which to me is like, oh, that's the way of doing things. Art is the outlet. Yeah. Thank you. It, yeah. <laughs> um, Grace, I actually have one more question for you before we end it, but I want to thank all of you so much for coming and sharing, um, you know, the personal stories and, uh, yeah. I don't know, it's, it's really healing, I think, to hear other artists and thinkers and curators talk about their experiences. And that's what we need right now. So thank you for coming out. So Grace, question for you, because I think it's such an amazing uh, action and gesture and um, motivation that you have your book available for free as well as a PDF online. I think it's absolutely incredible. So can you tell us a little bit more about uh, why you did that? Oh, thank you for asking that question. I really appreciate that. That's so kind of you. Um, Diana is still very much a struggling country and economically. I grew up very poor there. Um, and when I visit now, I try to be in Guyana again, pre-COVID. Um, I try to be in Guyana once or twice a year if I'm lucky. And every time I always go back to the library that after school, I would walk to the National Library in Georgetown. And in the library, you can't check out books. You have to sit there and you have to read the book right there and you have to give it back. And even the books that they have are very limited. They're under lock and key. And this is the situation for most libraries, most public libraries in Guyana. To, for, for all of the women, Suchitra and the 14 women who have contributed both their art and their stories to this book have been incredibly generous. And their stories need to be freely accessible and read. And so that was the most important priority for me that if you wanted to read this book and you have a phone or you have a computer, you can, you can read it because ethically it would be, it, I think it's really a, a, an issue of ethics. It would be unethical to, to create a book about Guyana and Guyanese people can't read it. That would make no sense. So, and that's possible, you know, this book being freely downloadable is possible because of the generosity of the women in the book and because they they shared their time and, and we poured over these stories. There's lots of drafts and lots of edits and lots of things happening. So I'm really thankful to them. But the, that situation about books and the availability and the accessibility of them is not unique to Guyana. It's, it's the same story for a lot of places in the Caribbean and throughout Asia and throughout Africa where you have all of this incredible stories and scholarship happening 
and people can't afford to to read them and see them. So that was our top priority. We got a grant to make sure that the book could be freely downloadable and accessible. And, and that was just the most important priority for me. And I'm really happy that with the help of these amazing women in the book, we can make it happen. Yeah, I love that so much. I think that's absolutely incredible. And um, I encourage everybody to buy Grace's book to support her as well and this amazing project. So um, check the chat uh, for a link to that. And thank you again, uh, Claudia, Shushitra, Grace, for coming today and joining this conversation. It's been absolutely wonderful and you're all inspiring. And I want to say a special thank you to you, Usha, and to Andrew, um, and to Lux and the whole team for your incredible generosity towards this book, and to Cosmo White for including us in his programming for his residency and exhibition. It's just incredibly generous all around. And Claudia, thank you for joining. It was so lovely to be in conversation about your work. I think the way you speak is beautiful. <laughs> Whoever is telling you otherwise is wrong. <laughs> um, and my friend Suchitra, who's always incredibly generous to to um, to this project and beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Fusha. Nice yeah. meeting you. <laughs> Thank you everybody for joining today and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and weekend coming up soon. So. <laughs> yes. Soon.